Uh, before anything else, please join me in a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, I just ask you to please send down the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Let's open up our hearts to the messages of life and love. And Mother Mary, we consecrate this night. Amen. And everybody here, uh, it's near enough in your heart. Please, we pray for your intentions and plans and projects for all of us. As we pray, Hail Mary. Full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We make a prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Say true, so the little flower. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're very excited that you guys are here, and we're really excited to welcome back Damon Owens, who's been a good friend of our junior girl program for many years. Phenomenal speaker, uh, speaking on a very important topic tonight. He's the founder of a joy to be, and does a ma many other things that I'll explain. So please give me a, a warm welcome for Damon Owens. Thank you, my brother. Boom. Thank you, Colin. You okay, sound-wise? Good, good. Good evening. Oh, come on now. You have got to be as happy to be out of the house as I am. You've got to be, because I'm excited. I uh, love my family, they know that very well, but I left this afternoon and I was like, bye! Because you know? <laughs> they know there's a, there's, a, there's a joy, there's a gift that, that I receive as much as I'm you know, uh, able to give from the Lord here. Just talking about our call, our unique call, our, our unique, if you can use the word right, our unique priesthood. We can understand that. We understand our, our baptism and our confirmation as Christians, as Catholics in particular, we're called to look at our entire life from the realm of priesthood. And I don't mean that in terms of clericalism or cleric, but priesthood really in terms of mediation, to literally mediate between God and man, between the supernatural and the natural. The, the, the heart of what it means to be a Christian is not to be moral. It's not just to do good and avoid evil. It's not to be the ones to point out everything that's evil and to be the ones, the agents, to, to bring on the kingdom of God by our attentiveness. We need to release that. That's part of your spirituality because that's a lie. The Lord looks at all of us as we say the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. But that priesthood does elevate us in a particular sense, or God himself elevates us in this understanding of priesthood because it carries with it another key word for tonight of stewardship and stewardship just like priesthood rightly understood gives us a framework it gives us a, a schema now those of you who don't know any idea who I am I'm I'm a recovering engineer so you're gonna hear words out of my mouth like vectors and schema and and stuff like this because that's just the way the Lord made my mind here but uh, we need a foundation we need something that gives us the, the, the terms of engagement, the rules of engagement. Why are we here? And it has to be authentic in the sense of being true to not only what it means to be a human person, because we're not animals. We're not um, just any creature, but there's a privilege, there's a, there's a truth about being a human person made in the image and likeness of God. That the more we come to that personal acceptance of that universal truth about our humanity, the more we can embrace the unique and unrepeatable instance of that in you and in me. And if we put one without the other, we're, we're, we're either left eye or right eye blind. If we accept that we're unique and unrepeatable, then we really don't have anything to talk about unless we accept the universal truth of our humanity. If we only accept our universal humanity, then there's nothing special about anybody else. We're just interchangeable. But if you hold those two truths together about the universal truth of what it means to be human and to explore the mystery, the mystery of being made in the image and likeness of God, and you celebrate with a awe, wonder, and fascination with the particular you that God's created, you have a potent mix, if you will, potent powerful to be able to have not only nights like this 
where we can gather, we can be encouraged, we can speak about things that matter to you and to our role here on earth. But we can continue to live this priesthood, this stewardship, this calling with joy. Because in the end, the end of the middle, the end of the beginning, it's about joy. Joy. Not just happiness or, you know, sort of delight, but an enduring and an abiding sense of knowing who we are, of knowing whose we are, and of knowing why we're here. Three things. Our identity, our relationship, particularly with God and with others, and with the mission. Those are three things that are particular to this universal reality of being human. Now, Colin mentioned that the, the, the current work that I do is, is particularly in marriage and family life. After leaving engineering, I, I went into full-time ministry back in 2002, really focused on this particular gift of natural family planning, which is a, which is a whole beautiful mystery that I've shared here on over the years past. But that gets into the broader questions and, and gift of marriage, which has been a part of work, again, for most of these 18 years or so in full-time work. I had took a stint about five years heading the Theology of the Body Institute outside of Philadelphia. And I know we have some students that are here as well. But that work is also you know, part of that, that, that mystery, that unpacking of this universal truth because this teaching called the Theology of the Body was a gift of St. John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, who gave us, again, an, another schema, another framework to understand who we are, whose we are, and why we're here, of answering the deepest and most important questions of our age, not in terms of morality, what's right or wrong, what's good or evil. That has limited and good place and purpose. But the deeper questions, as I said, are identity, relationship, and mission. Our particular subject tonight, engendered love, what we as Catholics need to understand about gender, is going to use that schema in order to enter into it. And the reason I wanted to start with sort of that, that, that bigger frame is because for us to be genuine stewards, meaning, meaning not the owners, not the arbiters, but those who've been selected by the master to be his voice, to be his presence, to be his steward in this vineyard. You follow my analogies here? It's a whole other posture to say, oh, we get to decide what's right. And as long as we're good Christians, we can figure out and we can, we can kind of, like we own the vineyard. And there's, there's, there's quite a bit of that going around. Trust me, if it's not in you, it's around. But when we embrace the reality of being a steward, we acknowledge the real owner of the vineyard, of God himself, the Father, who is the creator of all. And that whatever we have, wherever we are, and whatever we do, we have the choice as stewards to either be his voice or to be our own. And the scriptures speak about the good steward as the one who is, in fact, the voice and the, the owner himself Let's say in proxy, right? that you couldn't make a dis you can distinguish between the steward and the owner, because of how faithful we are to the wishes and to the truth of the owner. So that's that's where I want to begin. If we're going to be speaking about gender, let me put another frame around here before we dive into the content, because it's such a a public and not only public but a political issue. I'm speaking specifically about uh, transgender, about gender ideology, about uh, gender dysphoria, and on the, the psycholo psychological, the biological, the medical, the lived reality. Because it's so political and public, we have to step back first as stewards, as priest mediators, as Christians, as Catholics, to question even the terms of engagement that the culture gives us. So we can't come here and just find our own particular ammunition to sound just like everyone else in dealing with issues of gender, whether it's transgender or, or any other issues regarding it. We have to step back and begin with what the owner of the vineyard, what God himself has revealed. But it doesn't stop there. 
we still have to receive as unique and unrepeatable persons the fullness of the truth that we can receive and then to be able to speak in a way that is unmistakable from God. That's not just facts. That's not just statistics. That's not just science and biology. The fundamental foundation of who we are in our stewardship is love. It's love. Now, don't glaze your eyes over when I say love. I'm not talking about, can't we all just be nice to each other? Can't we all just kind of get along? Love takes courage. Love in our worldview is an act of the will. It's not a feeling, per se. It's the choice to will the good of another. To will the good of another. So it's not that we're called to, when God says, to love the Lord God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. He's not commanding us to feel a certain way. That would be ridiculous. It would be ridiculous to say, well, you should feel this way to everyone else. You should feel this way. with You can't control feelings. You, you, can't, you cannot control feelings, nor should you try. You can question them. You can make sure they don't dominate your life but you can't control them. That's a fallacy. So the love that we speak about is not feeling a certain way. It is, it is having the will, the strength, the courage to will the good, and not just any good, but to will the goodest good. Because there's a whole world and hierarchy of goods. So to just to will the good is a great start, but if there's something that's gooder, forgive my English, you will the gooder good. This is why love is always becoming. It's never static. It's never a one-time thing. It's always seeking. And as Christians, we have access to love himself. God is love. That doesn't mean that love is God, but God is love. So our willing the good as Christians and as stewards because of our baptism and our confirmation means we have access to love himself and are called to mediate into the visible reality of the world the invisible mystery hidden in God eternally. That's a, that's a noble calling. And again, it can't just be reduced to morality. It can't just be do good and avoid evil. It can't just be stop doing this. It has to be, I see you, I know you, and I love you. I will your good. I may not even like you. But you and I are both made in the image and likeness of God. We share the same Father. And my stewardship calls me to be a conduit of God's love into the world. Can we start there? If we accept that great mission as Christians, and we speak about gender, we have to ask the vineyard, Lord, what is gender? And the question is not as complicated as the world puts it. You see, the word gender, and even its, its entomology, gen, speaks about the beginning of life. It's the same root word for uh, generations, for genealogy, for to the verbs engender, to generate. The word gen speaks about the beginning of new life. And that beginning, even the book of Genesis, that is the first book of our scripture, speaks of the first few words there. In the beginning, the earth was dark and void, and the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. Jen speaks about the beginning, and particularly the beginning of life. We have always, rightly, in speaking of humanity, connected this word gender with sex. Because even in the secular sense, gender was a word that started to come into fashion when people more of the Victorian age didn't want to say the word sex. So they speak about the gender of the person or of the animal, right? So there's a human origin to it. But as far as humanity, the, the truth of who we are, gender and sex are inseparable. And this is before we even get into the theology. Gender and sex are inseparable. So let's speak a little more specific about that. Sex now, because of the, the new need for precise language, can best be understood as that attribute 
of the human person that is physical and biological. It begins with the, um, the genome, the chromosome, and this is the XX, the XY. Then it moves to the, um, the way the, the body expresses itself. And that expression of the body, in other words, how do those genetic markers begin to take shape in the body of the person? So we have a, a component that is sort of latent, if you will, in terms of the cellular, the, 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 the deoxyribonucleic acid, the markers that mark physiologically the distinction of the human person made male and female. But those symbols, those signals, if you will, those chemical markers, then have to take form in the body. And some of that sex that's uh, knowable at the moment of conception in the person can take 10, 12 years to manifest in the psychosomatic and the, the fuller bodily formation in later sexual development. Gender begins first with the consciousness, the acceptance of that sexuality. And it is part of a process. We have to accept not only the totality of who we are, but who we are as body persons. And that genotype that began with the genes, that now manifests itself in a phenotype, the expression through the body, we over time have to embrace the truth about who we are. Now the wrinkle or the particular unique part of gender is that this has to do on the biological with reproduction. This is why sex and gender are inseparable because they're connected through the biological reality of reproduction. So think about the, the sexual markers, the genotype, that carry with it the two primary, binary, if you will, manifestations of the human person. The phenotype is the sexual preparation that makes it possible for us to enter into reproduction. The consciousness, the beginning of gender, is the acceptance of our role in reproduction. And the fourth element, the second element of gender, is the social construct. In other words, how do we as a particular culture, a particular society, at a particular time, order ourselves as a culture toward that role of reproduction. So if you hold, which too much of the secular conversation dismisses, if you hold reproduction as the connecting thread, it will begin with the genotype through the phenotype through the consciousness of psychology to the social construct, the social acceptance. But it also helps us to recognize why there's such diversity in the world and throughout time. It's not just about pink and blue. It's not just about a dress versus pants. It's not just about makeup or long hair or short hair. Those things are the, the last end, that social agreement that is not rooted in anything permanent. It's just the agreement that we have as a culture about what represents our role in reproduction. And it will and should vary culture to culture, time to time. There's no fixed reality about what long hair means or short hair means or about a dress or about those things can and should fluctuate. But how do we embrace our role or potential role in reproduction? And that is inseparable from the biological reality of our role in reproduction. I want to make sure that, that, that we're, we're on the same page here. I am not giving you, at this moment, ammunition to go out into the world to teach the world. I want to talk together as believers so that we have a confidence to recognize what is not just part of our faith, but is proven and discernible and knowable in and through the biology. But we need to begin this conversation if we're going to talk about the transgender question, the transgender, the transgender dilemma with the people that are really suffering with this. But the reason that we're even talking about gender these days, I'm talking particularly in the last five years, seven years, this question in our modern culture has, has, has really become first and foremost around the challenges brought in by understanding what's called transgenderism. 
Now, even that phrase carries with it a whole philosophy. But let's use the language that we've been approached in in our culture. This idea that somehow there are, there are those of us, let me, let me just begin with the people themselves. The reality of our brothers and sisters, of our friends, maybe even our own family, of people that we love, know, or should love, who are at a deep and abiding conflict with their biological sex and their acceptance of it, their experience of it. And there have been different phrases throughout time that have tried to get, not to the last 50 years, that have tried to get to some kind of precision about what they're experiencing. And if we're going to begin, first of all, with this understanding of gender, that's reality, it's truth. But the real impact is we have people that we know and love who are in deep, deep pain. And the people who love them are sharing in that pain in some way or another. And some of you may be here who are sharing in the pain of people that we know and love who are at serious and profound fundamental disconnect, discord, discordance, dysmorphia. There's all these phrases that have come through that help to understand the disconnect between a biological sex, all leading with reproduction, and the personal sense of who I am. That third element of the gender sex, sex gender spectrum, but really that first part of gender. I don't believe that I am male. I don't feel that I am female. And we've heard these things. And the, and the language is, is understandably imprecise. And we have to develop a real compassion, not first for the people, but in that compassion for people dealing with this this, I, couldn't, I couldn't personally just, uh, justly say that I understand this because it's such a fundamental part of our humanity that for that to be so disjointed from, from our own identity that affects our relationship, that colors our mission. And yet if we are good stewards, if we are real mediators between God and man, then we have a more profound duty to be present, to love, to serve those brothers and sisters that we know and that are dealing with us in a way even if we don't feel equipped to do it. Our stewardship demands that we are present and that we love in the way that they need us to love them. And yet, our stewardship calls us to help them reconcile the goodness, truth, and beauty of their creation in God. This is the first posture, the first way that we stand, even as we come to a deeper understanding of gender and its connection to sex. If this is not ordered toward the good of the people that are suffering and the good of the people that are trying to figure out, they may not even be self-identify as transgender, but every one of us is trying to come to terms with the meaning of our femininity, ladies, with the deep meaning of our masculinity, men. Not just in some generic sense, but in the very particular you that God's created. What does it mean for your womanhood, your life, your being? What does it mean for your manhood, men? Gender is the, the essence of our bodiliness as people. And I'll talk a little bit about theology in a moment. But just to make sure we're grounded in our stewardship of making God present in this world, there is a brokenness that has now gotten a a, a, man, a magnificent stage here of our brothers and sisters who are at deep discord with their own gender. And the question for us as stewards should become, how do we love in a way that helps them live joy? Because that is the call of all of us, to live with a joy that's only the fruit of authentic love. That's our stewardship, that's our call. First part is for us to come to a security, an assurance of understanding what gender and sex is. What, Lord, what do you say? We are not the owners of the vineyard. Again, we are the stewards. So we don't have the capacity to create our own truth, to simply accept what's presented as is. That's, there's no exceptions to that because this is in our vineyard. And yet we know that God is. And we know that God is love. And you know that God cares and has created each one of us. So there is a particular stewardship that, that in 
one way or another, we are going to have to get good at. But first, understanding the truth of what gender and sex is in its wholeness. Then accepting like everything in the fallen world, there's brokenness. There's brokenness in everything in the created world because of the entrance of sin. Poetically described in Genesis chapter 3, the third book of our scriptures. So after the beautiful manifestation and creation, Genesis 1, the poetry of from God's view to man and from the beautiful manifestation and creation described from man's view to God in Genesis chapter 2, together they give us a beautiful story of what it was in the beginning. That there is a God, we're not him, and he created us out of sheer love in his image and likeness, meaning the capacity to give and receive love. But he created us as human persons. There are three types of persons in all of reality, only three types of persons. There are the divine persons, and there's only three of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then there are the angelic persons, the angels, created by God, creatures like we're creatures, but these creatures are pure spirit. And as we struggle to understand the, the, the creation of these, these spiritual persons, we know that there are unique, each angel is unique in number of people, almost a, a race into one themselves. And yet they're classified in what's we're classically known as, as choirs of angels. And their their being is described by their proximity, their closeness to God. So the the cherubim and the seraphim are the closest around God. I mean, you've got the principalities and the, the virtues. I have to all the orders. But there's a there's a choir of angels all understood by their closeness, their proximity to God. Then God creates a whole other order of persons. This is the poetry of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, of God creating a whole other order of persons that are not pure spirit, but body persons. So if we recognize the personhood beginning in God, the creature being created in the image and likeness of God, and now our personhood being this body person that has this material body, like the animals, and yet a spiritual soul, like the angels. We're a whole other order of persons that our bodies, we don't just have a body, we are a body. We don't just have a spiritual soul, we are a spiritual soul. And yet as human persons, you cannot separate the body and the soul. When God formed us as a body-soul person, Genesis 2 begins, the Lord God formed from the clay, the dust, the earth, the body, then breathed his spirit into the body, and then the poet says, man became a living being. And the theology behind that poetry is that we're not spiritual beings, that we're not animal beings. We are human beings. And that carries with it a whole order, a whole reality of isness, the isness of who we are. That this body soul composite is the truth about who we are as body persons. So when we speak about the body, we speak about the person. We see the body as being the physical reality, the physical encounter with the person, that the, the soul, the spirit, is the form of the body. And you actually, you know more of this than you realize. When, when we die, we actually deform. The body deforms at the loss of the, the separating the body and the soul. In fact, there's, there's, there's good study in the question of whether we're still even persons, human persons, when we die. We were never meant to die. We were never meant to die. Because what is death? The separation of the body and the soul. The body and the soul were never meant to be separated in the human person because it's the, the formation of the two that creates the human person. So death is like this cosmic obscenity. It was never meant to happen. This is how important the body is to the person. 
We don't have a body. We are a body. And that's not just for some of us. It's for all of us. John Paul II would say the body is the revelation of the person. Revelation like pulling back the veil. You know that I'm here because my body is making me present to you. I know that you're here for the same reason. And I'm spending time on this because we can't just dismiss the body as if it's an aside. Or as if the body itself is just an issue until we die and then we become the spiritual beings that go to heaven and all this gender stuff doesn't matter anyway because the real person is, is trapped inside this, this deformed body. And once we free ourselves of this body, then we'll be with God. That is one of the earliest heresies of Christianity. Like specifically, that is not of God. It's a whole other religion to view the body as an add-on or some kind of trap for the real person inside. And I know we say this, you know, colloquially, we say this, you know, off the cuff of, you know, see the real person and the spear is what matters the most. We, we say it in our language, but, and that's not altogether bad unless it changes our understanding of the truth. We cannot devalue the body. Because, and also it is the body that has sex. The male female is formed and made, ex made expressive through the body. Now there is some good study here. I don't want to confuse you and I don't want to go too far off in, in, in speculation, but there is, there is some beautiful, serious study about the engenderment of the soul. About, again, whether the gender is expressed through the body and not just simply a matter of the body. But I don't want to go too far afield here. I just want to elevate in our discussion and in your hearts the dignity, the worth, the value of the body. Because, again, we believe in the resurrection of the body after our death. A resurrection. Not a restoration not just restoring what we had before we died, but a resurrection, a raising up in value, a redemption of even the, the body that was deformed in the grave. There's an elevation of even the great dignity we have now, this body that now will have not only greater capacities, but a greater ability to reveal ourselves to each other. The body in God's salvation plan of creation, fall, sin, and redemption brings us from beginning to end. We will live eternally as a body person. And we will live eternally as a body person engendered, sexual, male, female, Now, here's, here's one last thing here before we get into the, the transgender, just to make sure we have a good, elevated dignity of the body. The meaning of our sexuality, the meaning, the meaning of why God created us male and female now in history is for marriage, specifically for the power to create life through love. Our sexual difference calls a sexual attraction, which calls us to a sexual union that has the capacity to create a new person, a third, who never existed before that will live eternally. So for the here and now, our sexuality has the meaning of marriage and procreation. In heaven, the meaning of our sexuality is not ordered toward that marriage. It's ordered toward the marriage to Christ. Now it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a mind and a heart bender. And I don't know that we'll have time to, to meditate on it, but I invite you to ask the Lord, Lord, what does that mean? Because it freaks most people out when they first hear that God wants to marry us. And yet, if you've read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you know that marriage was there in the beginning, before the law, before doctrine, before dogma, before commandments, 
before the church, before there were seven sacraments in the church, there was only one that embodied everything mediating from heaven to earth. One sacrament, not seven. Marriage. Marriage is the fruit of the union of two sexually dimorphic persons who can become one and call into existence a new person that never existed before was meant to be the sign for all creation of who God is and of who we are to God. Stewards to be able to bring life and love into the world. This is what our sexuality means. One of the key quotes of this theology of the body, John Paul says, the body, in fact, only the body, is capable of transmitting into the visible reality of the world the invisible mystery hidden in God eternally and be a sign of it. That's a, that's a boatload of dignity right there. Only the body is capable of transmitting the invisible mystery of God into the visible reality of the world? The marriage of Adam and Eve, our first parents in Genesis chapter 2, even in that poetry, reveals to us that there is an original, call it a primordial, first order dignity to our sexuality, to our sexual union, and the capacity to create new life that still endures today even after the entrance of sin described in Genesis chapter 3. So when we, you and I, right now in 2020, speak about gender, this is not merely a biological issue. This is certainly not a political issue. That's an insult. You and I speak about gender as part of our priesthood, asking the questions, how do we bring, Lord, your love into this life and to be the good stewards so that everything that we do makes us unmistakably connected to you. If we can hold up that dignity of gender, connect it with sex, connect it with procreation, connect it with our origin and our destiny, that should fuel a compassion, a zeal, not just an interest, a zeal to be able to help those who are broken in this reality. To those who are now embracing an understanding of this brokenness of their, of their gender, this disconnect, this dysphoria. And dysphoria is just a, it's just, it's just a word that is the opposite of euphoria. We should be euphoric about the realities of who we are, that awe, wonder, and fascination. What happens when we're not? And it's not just gender dysphoria in the sense of transgender, the word that we've been, we've been given, but there's dysphoria happening within your femininity, within your life. There's a lack of euphoria, a lack of joy in the embracing of your masculinity, men. So we can even put it on a spectrum, if you will, of our human formation that says, until we experience the fullness of that euphoria and that joy, there is something that we still have to reconcile. We still need healing and wholeness in order to embrace this particular reality of manhood in Damon Owens. What is it about my desires? What is it about the way that I see myself? What is it about the relationships that I have, even my wife and my children, that's somehow so deficient from the manhood that God's created me for? And we don't do it with a despair. We don't do it with, oh, gee, is this really, the gospel of the suck. That's what my priest friends would say. We don't believe in the gospel of the suck. Man, life sucks, I suck, this sucks, let me make it suck less. That's the gospel of the suck. And we're Christians, so we have, we have less suck than everybody else. That's a terrible, that's not, that's not even gospel. There's no good news in that. That's just how do we maintain until we die and then go to heaven? That's horrible. What kind of vineyard are you going to make? Like, what kind of wine are you going to make out of those grapes? So I say, yeah, I want some of that. No, the joy comes in the supernatural, God infusing himself and doing the impossible of what we can never do on our own. And then give a witness and say, how do you do this? The Lord has done this. And people say, give me some of that. Lord, I need some of that. You have just done evangelization, catechesis, and discipleship. All from an experience and of a testimony. So let's spend a little bit of time in this particular brokenness 
that's been labeled transgender. And I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm hoping here that the, the complete and utter compassion here for the real people with real pain living this. I, actually, I literally have a call tomorrow with a very close friend of mine whose son is, is going through this right now, wanting to transition. They don't know what to do. This is real to me. This is not some interesting topic. This is real. So the first and foremost, it's not about the ideas and the concepts and the abstract. Those things should help in our mind to fill our hearts with compassion and empathy, to want to engage, to not want to rationalize away, to not simply want to connect with someone and not bring them the truth and to be that place of compassion in Christ for them. It's got to be both and. So we begin and we end with the person. How can we bring the kingdom of God to this person? And if we don't begin and end there, we're not only of no earthly good, we are of no divine good. That being said, we also have a divine imperative to speak the truth and to know what is true. Now moving from the person, how do you help them? We need to challenge the paradigm that we've been given that tries to explain their experience. We recognize there are all kinds of brokenness in between sex and gender. There are disorders of sexual development that are well documented, intersex. They're at the chromosomal level, the genotype level, they're at the phenotype level. Maybe phenotypically, the, the, the signals of the genes are not being manifested in the body. There are a whole list of disorders of sexual development. They call them DSDs. And in the same way, there are a whole list of brokenness along the gender, the consciousness, and in the social of accepting our sexuality and gender. So there's no question about the lived experience and the brokenness. The question is, how do you understand it and explain it in order to help? And the foundational truth that we've been given, small t truth, is that those who experience the gender dysphoria or gender discord are living examples of the non-existence of gender and sex. In other words, that there are some who are experiencing a gender dysphoria is proof that there are not two sexes or two genders. That in fact, we are the liars in speaking about sexual dimorphism, male, female. We are the ones imposing this idea that we're created male and female, that in fact it's a, it's a fluid, it's a spectrum. You've heard all these phrases. That, that the whole idea of sexual complementarity is an imposition created by religion in order to uh, oppress and in order to create some religious dogma that doesn't address reality. That in fact in all time there have been people who have not fit into the neat bubbles of male and female so therefore, there are no bubbles of male and female. It is a spectrum. And you don't know someone's sex, and you don't know someone's gender until they tell you. And, and I'm really trying to steel man this. I'm not trying to straw man this. I'm not trying to mock anyone. I'm not trying to make stuff up. I've, there's a whole diversity of thought, a whole diversity of vocabulary in this transgender you know, umbrella under this. So there's no one singular ideology or explanation, but there are things that they hold in common that we have an obligation to challenge. Because this structure is what we've been given as the explanation of the experience of our brothers and sisters. It's not denying their experience. It's providing a whole other schema, a whole other structure to explain, well, they're experiencing this because they're feeling an internal tension of, of what you're imposing upon them of the sex assigned at birth. Anybody heard that phrase before? And that you can't determine someone's sex or gender because y y there's nothing that's objective about it. You can't look at the phenotype. You can't just look at the body because that's not fair. There's other things going on. You can't look at the, the, the DNA because there's all the different you know, disorders of sexual development. You can't look at just two types of gender because people are telling you right now that they're... they're this is not my body. This, this is not who I feel. I'm in the wrong body. Now, you've got to give people latitude, right? You, you can't just go pouncing on people when they say 
things that sound ridiculous to us, right? I'm in the wrong body. Because they're grasping for a vocabulary to help us understand what they're experiencing. That's part of our compassion. So we can't demand you know, vocabulary precision from somebody who's in pain and is hurting. But when people take those words and then create an entire schema that contradicts the dignity of being made male and female, the truth of our sexuality, that's not merely religious, it's, it's, it's scientifically understood and still operative in most every area of science, particularly in the biological sciences. You, you can't dismiss male-female and operate any kind of medical work. Certainly not research, not in practice, not in pharmacology, not in, it, it's, it's fundamental to every area of human science. But we have been told that there is a whole other explanation for the human person that we're not made male and female, that there's a fluidity that moves from what we call female to what we call male, and everyone fits within it. And I propose to you that with the same zeal that you and I have to love and to serve and to be present and to bring Christ to the people who are dealing with this dysphoria, that same zeal we need to have to say, that's not true. Whatever explanation we come to help people understand it, let's do that. But let's not accept everything that's brought to us. And here's the first thing to help you understand how wrong this transgender ideology is. Not those experiencing transgender, but the explanation that's been foisted on us to help us understand it. Every part of the transgender ideology begins with the rejection of procreation. It begins with the rejection of reproduction as the common thread to understand gender. You have to take reproduction out and tip in its place the lived experience of the person. Because if you bring reproduction back in, you are now bound by biology. You are now bound by what's observable and what happens between the two genders come together and have the capacity to become one flesh. And that's not just a religious term. In sexual intercourse, when a man and a woman enter into sexual intercourse, it actually creates a complete reproductive system that neither a man nor a female has on their own. Every other system in our body, biologically, is complete. The digestive system, the nerves, nervous, nervous system, the skeletal system. Name every system in the body. Digest, I just digest it. Any system in the body, it is complete, except one. The reproductive system, whether you're talking about the gamete of the spermatozoa, the gamete of the oocyte, and the woman's body, only carries 23 chromosomes of the 23, of the 46 that are in every other cell in the human person. Half. And that half system, united in sexual intercourse, not just biologically, but in every part of the system, creates a whole system. Two become one. It's observable biologically. You have to ignore that. You have to absolutely reject reproduction as having anything to do with sex and gender in order to accept any of the transgender ideologies. And when I say ideology, I'm not just, I'm not, I'm spurious. I people accuse me. So you say ideology, it makes it sound so, I don't know what other word there is. It's, it's a series of beliefs that tries to explain the meaning of something. Ideology. Right? It's, not, it's not me trying to insult anyone. What is the set of beliefs that we've been given to help us understand what a person is experiencing in gender dysphoria? That's a worthy study. But that doesn't mean that everything we've been given is true <laughs> and that we have to accept it because people are suffering. That's dumb. And that's not helpful. What's helpful is understanding what's true. What's the series of understandings of this experience? Therefore, how can we help people to be whole and joyful? And you can't begin with a lie and end with the truth. This is, this is my zeal. I hope you see my passion here. The passion here is not about being right in some ideology. It's not, even as an engineer. I'm a steward, Christian steward first. My first is, I've got people that I know who are suffering in this, and I can't find them help. I cannot find them help, real help. 
besides the idea under this transgender that you help them by assisting them in living the gender that they feel is right for them in this moment. Again, I'm trying to steel man. I'm not trying to straw man. If we accept the fluidity of the, the concept of gender, transgender ideology, it's not just how I feel forever. It's very much what I believe I, who I believe I am right now. And I have every right, every right to change it if my feelings change, if my sense changes, not just feeling. If my sense of self changes, then I have every right to manifest that and to express myself in that identity. I can't do that if you ever consider reproduction. And yet we begin, not just from the theological, but from the biological, that our very being as body persons has the highest munis. That's the word munis, M-U-N-U-S. It's a word we use, a Latin word, that speaks about a duty, an office, a high honor, a gift that we've been given by the owner in order to exercise that we can never earn on our own. We have the ability to participate in God's own life and love made visible in the reality of the world. That's a, that's a noble calling, and it carries with it the capacity to create new life. Whether you have children or not, whether you marry personally or not, we have a human reverence for the reality that it's even possible. Just the fact that it's possible should put every one of us on our knees. Possible that two unique, unrepeatable persons can come into such union and communion that their union has the capacity to create a third. That's not just sex. That's like sex. Sex. That should like buckle our knees. Like our very being has the ability for us to enter into an act that calls into existence a new creature that never existed before. And we go, sex. Priggers. Stupid word like a little loop. Are you kidding me? We should be buckling at the fact that the owner of the vineyard entrusts us to share in his deepest reality. The deepest truth about God is that he is love and he is life. He doesn't just have love and have life. He is all being. And we share in his being and we call it existence. We don't have our own being. We share in the being of the one true God. And he is life and love. And he has gifted us to share in this. And it's stamped right into our bodies. That should animate the way we walk and the way we talk with an awe, a wonder, and a fascination. And it should wrench our hearts when a brother or sister of ours cannot enjoy, cannot endure, cannot participate in that joy. That should rend our hearts. So we should be searching for this truth to enter into the world to understand that compassion and then to understand more fully so that we can help them experience that joy. And it can never be through chemical or physical or hormonal deformation. I say that strongly but deeply with compassion. What we're presented as the four stages of transition that is the true healing under the transgender ideology is a horror show. And I have met, I have interviewed, I don't have any personal friends who've gone through this yet, I hope to, <laughs> to really better understand it. The people that I trust who speak about this, who are deeply involved in this, say it's that approach, the four-step transition. First is a social transition, then it's a cross-sex hormone treatment, then it's a, uh, a full hormonal, and then it is a surgical transition. That It's a, it's a broad statement, and I, and I want to be delicate. The euphoria that many speak about after a surgery or cross-sex hormones or, or during the full hormonal transfer, that the euphoria that happens 
is a 10-year reality. It's got a 10-year moment of euphoria before not only do you return to that level of dysphoria, but it actually makes it worse. And without being flippant, it's, it's not unlike that 10-year horizon of that, that tattoo. It, it, everything looked, it's just wonderful. That, that ten, then after 10 years, like, what the hell was I thinking? And again, I don't want to be flip. I just, I'm, just, I'm trying to help us understand that we need to, to, to recognize there is a, there's an ebb and a flow of answering the question between what is true and good and beautiful and what is it that someone is asking and is it good for them. At every stage, our love and compassion should drive us to help ourselves first, put the mask on first, to help ourselves live with the joy and the euphoria of our creation as body creatures in the image and likeness of God made male and female to share in God's call of life and love so that we can then be the steward to share with anyone their equal call to this. And when those feel that they are so far away from sharing in that euphoria, we have an even more obligation to journey with them to accompany them, to walk with them, to be Christ for them. But make no mistake, the brokenness, the hurt, the reality of gender dysphoria, of disorders of sexual development, of not participating in this great gift of life and love is not proof that God created us genderless or that somehow gender is merely a social construct, or that gender is merely psychological, or that gender has nothing to do with sex, it has nothing to do with reproduction, that there's nothing special about being made male and female. We need to challenge these false explanations of real lived experiences of our brothers and sisters and to do it with joy because we're not trying to win an argument. We're not trying to get some triumphalism about our own faith or our own understanding or our own gift of being stewards. In the end, even in the moment, we will be held accountable for how much of the love that God has given us that we have shared with others and how truly we have manifested his life and love to those few, really few, that he put in our life and in our path. We don't change the world. We change the world that God has put us in. And in that world that God has given us, and the people that we encounter, the places that we live, and the people we may see in a moment, the people we may spend years with, our spouses, we are all about bringing the kingdom of God. And what God has created from the beginning, the human person made male and female in his image and likeness, and that gender that lives right in the, the history that we live now and that will be elevated and redeemed in heaven is worth it. This is what God's created. And he's created you and me to live in this moment right now to proclaim the goodness, truth, and beauty of being created that way. And it's hard. <laughs> but so what? It's worth it. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, your truth, your love, your beauty, your goodness is all that matters, is all that is. Help our words, help our vocabulary, help our nuance, help us to not just speak your truth and to speak you, but to be able to be heard. Help us to learn from one another with a reverence. Presume each other's more superior than ourselves, that we can have the humility to hear our story, to hear our hurt, and to express our love, the love that you've given us freely without cost, we give freely without cost. Bless those that have heard, bless myself who have spoken, Lord. Help us to encounter you in everything, in the hearing and in the speaking. In other words, Lord, help us to live your promise of our baptism and the power of our confirmation and to be vessels of mercy, to be vessels of your divine mercy. And all these things, Lord, we ask through your Son, 
who is Holy Mother? Through our Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good. Amen. I'll just one round of applause for Jamie Elliott. Guys. So we want to open up for a bit of our Q&A. Uh, so just feel free. Chris has got a microphone. Uh, you know, just keep your distance of people, obviously. Wear your mask. When you ask a question, feel free to take off the mask. Um, and so I want to start off with a question myself. And so if anybody else wants to ask a question, please come up and uh, line up over here. Um, but Damon, you know, just talking about how ideas have consequences, you know, one of the main reasons why um, I wanted someone to come and speak on this topic is because if, you know, if, if, if I say this with all compassion, if we don't believe in gender or, or there is masculine femininity, how are we supposed to discover our identity as son and fathers, son or daughters of the father? Yeah. And what are the consequences also of that idea, even within the church, understanding the marriage of heaven, the church itself? Could you just touch upon that a little? Yeah, way? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know, I know what you're getting at, um, Colin, and it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to overstate, and I tried to lay a foundation here of the dignity of, of, of gender, but on the negative side, the reality is that if we lose the power of our own understanding of gender and our ability to, to proclaim it, we lose that primordial reality that God gave us of the entire salvation story. We have no means to talk about God, and we've been told, we've been given God as a, as a father. Now, that fatherhood is not sexual. It doesn't mean that he's male. Dr. Peter Kreef, if you're familiar with, with the brilliant philosopher from Boston College, he talks about uh, what he calls cosmology, the whole cosmos. And this is all the created world. And the cosmos can be understood as masculine and feminine. And, you know, whether you look at, you know, the, some of the Asian traditions of the yin-yang, or you look at night and day, or if you look at, you know, there's this complementarity that cosmologically can be called masculine feminine. That together, they don't contradict one another, but together they become something that neither one is on their own. And you can find that throughout nature, whether you're in a microscope or a telescope, whether you're looking at in science or whether you're looking in poetry, that that symmetry of, of masculine feminine, two becoming one, is part of the created cosmos. And what theology tells us, what God tells us the meaning, the divine meaning of that is that that's true because that's who God is. God is a communion of persons. So everything we talk about begins with who God is and it ends with who God is. And he's revealed himself to us using terms we can understand as father and son. Father meaning everything comes from him. To father, taking out the sexuality piece to father is to create something that can exist outside of you and to ensure it's good. That's the ultimate truth of fatherhood. And we say God is father because everything comes from him. But everything that comes from father, the father, who can receive the totality of God? Not us, we're creatures. The Son, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, this is our vocabulary that helps us understand the communion of father and son. And we've been told that Jesus stands before the Father, receive everything the Father is. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The Father and I are one. All this language that Jesus spoke in the scriptures was about this unity and communion of Father and Son. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. And neither one is the Holy Spirit. And yet the communion of Father and Son, they're in such unity, such unity, outside of time, that the very union of the Father and the Son actually exists. It's the Holy Spirit. That's just, you know, Trinity primer, right? But this is who God is. So when he says, let us make man in our image and likeness, male and female, he created them. We believe he transferred into the visible reality of the world the invisible mystery hidden in God eternally. That the human person made male and female allows us to enter into a communion of love that can bring life. If we lose that, it's not just a symbol. It helps us understand the entire salvation story. It's why marriage is the sign of salvation. 
It is why marriage is understood in the last book of the New Testament as the very description of heaven. The whole story ends with Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride entering into the eternal union and all of heaven is a wedding feast. This is, the, this is the, the vocabulary to help us understand this is not about do good and go to heaven. Be Jesus' friend and get to go to heaven. God wants to marry us. And marriage, as the communion of persons, can only happen through complementarity. If we reject or dismiss or diminish the dignity of gender, we cannot speak the salvation story. And in fact, it renders the salvation story null and void. This is a big deal. And we can do that and still be fully present and compassionate to those who are dealing with the real need for reconciliation of their identity because of this distance and dysphoria with their own gender. We can do both. You know, this is not about taking sides. It's about authentically loving by being present and showing Christ, just the way Christ always did. It's physical, it's spiritual, it's intellectual, it's emotional, it's human. And that's the humanity that we need to bring to it. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering, when it comes to terms, masculine and feminine, I, you know, with, with, what we hear from the culture is that it's a social construct, especially, you know, you mentioned about colors, like blue, pink, like dress, <laughs> yeah. pants. Right? Like, how do we how do we argue that masculinity and femininity is past a social construct? And further, what is, what does it mean to be a true man or a true mm. woman? Mm. Right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, how long do I got? Oh my God. <laughs> Great question. Great question. I'll give the short answer, of course. Um, so I, I didn't finish. So masculine feminine is the cosmological. And in the cosmos is man and woman. So being made male, female is the human manifestation of the cosmology of masculine and feminine. So they're connected. The universal is the, how's the whole creation made, you know, made for community so that life can be. Well, the human person in this cosmos is made male, female. So it's the instance of masculinity that manifests in my maleness. It's the instance of femininity that manifests in woman, in my particular woman, Melanie. Now, it's, it's only connected through when the two can become one flesh. So we have to hold two things that seem to be contradictory. One, that we're made in the image and likeness of God. I am, you are, unique, unrepeatable, that's true. And yet, the union of man and woman is more of the image and likeness of God because God himself is a communion of persons. So if you're science or you're, you know, physics or whatever, it's the difference between the potential and the actual. Our, our masculinity, our maleness, our femininity, our female is the potency. It has the power, the potential for us to enter into a communion that can express love and give life. So it's not in and of itself until the the, the person in act as John Paul would say, the person acting in love is one who lives in communion. So our witness is not one of ideology of masculine feminine. Our witness is about love and the communion. When we express the communion that we're made for, then we can honor what is making the communion possible. Does that make sense? So we don't, we don't begin with just the potent potential. We talk about what's possible. And you can do that biologically, you can do it sociologically, you can do it theologically, you can do it biochemically, you can do it, it's all different because of the cosmos of masculine and feminine, it shows up in all of these logies, in all of these studies, right? You can't say, no matter how much, oh, this is always, I, I need your trust here to be able to just get to it. A man and a man can love themselves so nobly, so nobly, that it is not only an authentic love, it is a witness to the world of what love is. Full stop. But all love, love is not love. It's one of the big lies of our culture. Love is, all love is good. All love is from God. But to think that all love is the same is demonstrably false. All love is not the same. My love for my daughters, I have eight children, seven daughters, 
and Nathan. <laughs> and I have a wife too, Melanie. I love Melanie. I promised it at the altar, and I'm spending the last 27 years trying to live up to that promise. Doing all right, not really well. Doing all right. I get great on a curve. <laughs> but I love Melanie. And I love Naomi, Leah, Rachel, Therese, Colette, Veronica, Olivia, and Nathan. <laughs> but you and I know that if I love my children the way that I love my wife, you need to put me under the jail. Are you going to tell me that I don't love my daughters? Of course I do. My son? Absolutely. But love is not love. Eros, philia, storge, agape, the Greeks knew, the noble pagans, the different types of love. We know there's love and friendship. We know there's love and romance. We know there's love of father and of a mother. We know there's love of a neighbor. We know there's love. There's all kinds of love and all love is good. All love is from God, but not all love is the same. So when we speak about the love of Two men, three men, two women, three women. We need to cheer like louder than anybody else. To will the good of one another is the principle of Christian love. But what does that love look like that still keeps it in the order of love? And in the same way, being made male and female means that we have this capacity to love that's unique to marriage. It's a marital love because of the gift given, the totality of the persons that can create a new flesh that can call new life into existence. So we hold up marital love as a particular type of love without denigrating any other love, but just recognizing this is different than any other love because of what it is and what it can do. And if we can do that with a joy and a sincerity and, a, and an attractiveness, then we're inviting people to explore all of the kinds of love that should be authentically lived based on that particular type of love. Friendship has its own type of expressions. Motherhood and fatherhood have their own type of expressions. Filial love, your brothers and your sisters, has a typical kind of love, a, a particular. And marital love has a particular expression. All of these things give deeper meaning to what we can observe in the physical reality of the world. Last part. What does it mean to be a real man? It means to accept this particular call to be initiative in willing the good of others. Every one of us, male and female, both receive and give love. To be a self-gift is not just a one-way street. Men give, women receive. That's dumb. But we can look at the body to give glory to the two necessary parts of what love needs. It needs to be given, initiated, and it needs to be received. And it turns out that every one of us receives and gives because you can't give what you don't have. The love we give is a portion of the love that we've received, period. A real man is one who uses the power of his masculinity made maleness in his unique, unrepeatable way to will the good. And we can see biologically, for the most part, men are 50% more brute strength than women. It's, it's not you, you know every single person. But if you look across the board, men are built with 50% roughly more brute strength. So we have calls to use that physical strength to will the good, whether it's for protection, whether it's for providing, whether it's for, but it's not a hard and fast, but a real man accepts this capacity to use his strength order to the good. Femininity carries with it this power to nurture new life, motherhood. And that motherhood isn't always biological. It usually is, but it's not always. It doesn't have to be. We call our heads of religious orders Mother Teresa, Mother Angelica, Mother Agnes. I mean, these names are there not just to be cute, but because their very femininity in their motherhood is ordered toward the nurturing of life. Father Jim, Father Mike, those aren't just terms of nicety. They've ordered their masculinity and their strength to be a, a father to engender life, spiritual life in us through the sacraments, through their presence in a way that even our ordinary priesthood can't. So real manhood and real womanhood is about getting to the authentic truth of what God created us in the order of love as communion. We have a question from yes. the live stream. Uh-oh. Hi. <laughs> How come people who struggle with their gender identity have a difficult time accepting themselves for who they are? Hmm. 
accepting for who they are. I'll have to do a little interpretation of the question. So um, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm growing in, in my, my understanding and my, my empathy, my real understanding, because it's hard to, it's hard to really know someone else's experience, not just in the transgender issue, but in anything. Um, I know because of the, the dignity, the value, the worth of the body, uh, and you hear this in people who have um, dis physical disabilities, you know, what that does to your identity when you can't physically do for yourself, and there's an utter dependence on the other. It gets at your identity. It gets at your relationships that you can have with people. It starts to question your mission. Why am I even here if I can't do? That's a physical disability. Emotional, depression, anxiety, um, psychological disorders, all these things have this ability to drive us to question our identity, relationships, and mission. So I can only imagine having that kind of dysphoria, almost anger, that, that out-of-body sense that my body doesn't reflect who I believe I am. I can only project into that world of that experience that it would have a profound impact. If there's a God, why would you create me this way? You know, we would say, why did you allow me to be created this way? But, but why, why would a God create me this way unless I'm something other? And whenever we're other in a culture, it opens us up to ridicule, for isolation, to be othered. And this is why there's a particular role as Christians in drawing in, not pushing out. But as to the, the psychology of the person, if I'm hearing the question, uh, I don't know. But I'm not shocked by it because every other type of experience of of dysphoria with the body, body dysmorphia, um, addiction, um, all these things that break, they have the, the, this, this power to make us question our worth. You know, who, who am I? Who would want me? Am I worthy to be loved for who I am? Or do I have to do something to earn somebody's love? Are other people willing or even capable of fulfilling my needs? You know, there's two fundamental questions about my, my ability to, to receive love and others' ability to give it, I can only imagine that not knowing my role in reproduction, not agreeing, if you will, bad vocabulary, with what my role is in life and love would be a profoundly, profoundly uh, disturbing reality. So what do you accept? Do you accept it as disorder? Like there's something out of order with, with my being, whether it's psychological or physical? And I need to change either my mind or my body because they're out of whack. Or is this the way that I am? That, that there is no gender? That, that in fact, you know, we have to come, I'm, I'm proof that most people may have euphoria and correlation, cord, accord with their body and their mind, but some people have discord. So maybe the whole structure of gender is wrong. I get how the ideology comes out. But as people are struggling with that, I think we have a particular place of expressing and being Christ to them that first assures them that God knows them, that he loves them as they are, and that whatever discord um, is worthy of healing. And I will accompany you even without answers to help you in that healing. So hard to get into the identity of why people don't accept who they are, but it's understandable given the value that we place on our role in reproduction. Good. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me out of the house. I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.